Are you a healthcare professional looking for a trusted concussion resource? Then you've come to the right place. From her New York City studios, welcome to Concussion Corner with your host, Dr. Jessica Schwartz. Welcome to the Concussion Corner podcast. My name is Dr. Jessica Schwartz, and I'm thrilled to continue our Olympic theme after last week's interviews with Dr. Jeff Kutcher. Today, we'll be interviewing Dr. Carolyn Baxter, who is a physical therapist for the U.S. Ski and Snowboard team. She is based out of Park City, Utah, and spends roughly a third of her year traveling with the U.S. Free Ski Halfpipe team to domestic and international competitions. Most recently, Dr. Baxter wrapped up a trip to the X Games in 2018 in Aspen, Colorado, and will be traveling to Pyeongchang, North, uh, South Korea, next week for the 2018 Winter Olympic Games. Dr. Baxter completed Evidence in Motion's year-long concussion management certification in 2016. Following this program, Dr. Baxter partnered with Dr. Jeffrey Kutcher and implemented the first sports neurology pre-participation exam for the U.S. Free Ski Halfpipe team. This practice will go company-wide for the 2018-19 season. Additionally, Dr. Baxter has served as guest lecturer on concussion rehabilitation at the University of Utah and has presented at the 2017 Medical Emergencies in Skiing and Snowboarding Conference. And most importantly, she has a corgi named Cormac. Carolyn, welcome to the Concussion <laughs> Corner podcast. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Jess. I'm stoked to be here. Oh, I'm stoked to have you here as well. And um, how are you feeling after you just got back from X Games? Uh, you know, I'm recovering from the exhaustion. It was a uh, Let's see, I was working straight since December 31st, so it's been kind of a, a whirlwind of adventures, but uh, yeah, I think I'm recovering well, and I'm really looking forward to next week in South Korea. Indeed, you know, I, I think we all, you know, think of the athletes all the time when we're seeing, you know, awesome things like Olympic and X Games, but we can't forget about the medical providers, because that's, you know, again, who this podcast is geared towards, um, but you guys are really putting in work. What kind of hours are you putting in day in and day out? Oh my gosh. I, uh, let's see. I think I just put in a 20 hour day the other day. I got two hours of sleep, spent uh, maybe 9 PM to 12 PM in the hospital with an athlete and got home and another athlete had the flu. So it's uh, you just never know what you're going to get on the road and you just got to be prepared to roll with the punches every day you wake up. I, I hear you. And, you know, I was just looking at the CDC uh, map because, you know, I'm a nerd as we've, we've known each other for a little <laughs> while. <laughs> Sure and uh, I did. I saw uh, basically Hawaii is the only, you know, area that does not have the flu in this country. So, oh, my gosh. Yeah, um, it's been crazy. Yeah. So so thoughts for potentially other Olympic uh, hopefuls for later on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Big concern, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. So um, how do you want to be? How do you want to go by Carolyn, Kara? What's what's your preference for today? Uh, you can call me Kara. That's fine. Awesome. OK, so. Uh, for our listeners, you know, Kara and I go way back. I really have to, you know, I'm very humbled and, and grateful to, we had our first six. Um, I program direct and I started the world's first year-long post-professional and interdisciplinary program that's specifically related to concussion for the healthcare provider. Uh, and Kara was one of our first six, our inaugural, our inaugural six, um, to take part in that program. And I have to say, I keep in contact with uh, most of these guys, and it's just wonderful to kind of see where they're kind of stretching their, their spreading their wings and, and just doing good work. So it's awesome to have you on here. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. It's it's fun to come back to you and be like, look, Jess, look what I'm doing now. <laughs> no, it, it's so thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a sense of pride. So uh, I'm awesome to to see you guys doing great things. Yeah, for sure. All right, so you know we kind of start off all these podcasts similar, um, and essentially I I love the work of Simon Sinek, and essentially he says start with your why. Um, so mm -hmm. I'd love to kind of you know let the listener know like, hey, you know how can um, I potentially follow the trajectory of, you know, Dr. Baxter uh, in her footsteps. So if you wouldn't mind letting them know, like, hey, this is kind of how and where I started. Um, mm -hmm. And we can start from your, you know, pre-college days to your figure skating all the way through to where you are now, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I have a, I have a strong figure skating background. It was my whole life for a while growing up. Um, so that was my introduction into sports medicine. You know, I had countless injuries, kind of the classic story of as an athlete, I was injured and wanted to become a physical therapist. And then in college, I went to Northeastern University in Boston, I'm a New England native. And I got introduced to Dr. Lenore Herget and Dr. William Meehan out there. And uh, Lenore was really starting to delve into concussions right around that time. So that's, that's kind of how I got my feet wet there. And then I took a job in private practice in Park City, 
after graduating and saw probably up to four or five new concussion cases a week and felt totally ill-equipped to manage them and wasn't necessarily satisfied with some of the answers they had gotten from the healthcare system. So that led me to Evidence in Motion's year-long course, uh, which was phenomenal and really pushed me and showed me that you just there's no concrete answer with concussions and you've got to stay up to date on the literature and again, be flexible. And from there, I took a job as the physical therapist uh, with the U.S. free ski half pipe team with U.S. ski and snowboard. And that's where I am today. Oh, so awesome to hear. And, you know, for, for me, especially for me too, but for our listeners as well, would you mind letting them know what exactly the U.S. free ski and half pipe team is? Yeah, sure. So U.S. Ski and Snowboard is a, a huge organization with I don't even know how many disciplines from Alpine to Nordic to uh, Snowboard Halfpipe to what I do, which is Free Ski Halfpipe. Um, so they're doing crazy tricks in the, in the halfpipe, um, anything from a, a straight air that's 25 feet out of the halfpipe to a dub 12 where they're, they're flipping twice in the halfpipe. And it's a it's a crazy, exciting sport to watch, but we're dealing with a lot of trauma as well. If you come even, you know, six inches, 12 inches off of the half pipe wall, you could fall up to 40 feet. Um, so coming into this job, I was sure glad that I had the evidence in motion program in my back pocket to deal with some of these injuries we're seeing on a regular basis. Yeah, and I think I'll let the listener in. You know, Kara and I chatted a little bit before we started recording uh, just to kind of catch up, which it's, it's great to see her doing such great things. Um, you know, but essentially... I always ask all of our students when they come in, like, hey, what are five expectations of me as your program director for the year-long program? And everybody always asks, like, hey, well, what's an objective measure? What test can I run for concussion? Um, and that's, you know, I think comical for, for Dr. Baxter now because um, I think she can kind of tell you firsthand that, you know, the, 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 the heterogeneity of the injury and people and, and so on and so forth. What are your thoughts there? No, that's absolutely right. I, it's a clinical diagnosis. There's no one imaging test. There's no objective test and measure I can do as a physical therapist that's going to say, yes, for sure, this athlete in front of me is concussed. Um, we're ruling out things all the time, like sleep, anxiety, depression, um, all of those things kind of have overlays with concussion. So you really have to look at the individual in front of you and take a very comprehensive approach. There's no, you know, five things you can go to that'll give you that definitive answer. Indeed, you know, it's, it's almost like the matrix when I say, you know, when I started to kind of get an under, more, a better understanding of this injury, not just after my own, but as a clinician, um, my own injury, I should say, you know, it's kind of like felt like the matrix, you have all of these moving parts, then you mm -hmm. kind of get to see them in like slow motion. I don't know if you feel like that as a more <laughs> senior clinician, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we don't have to delve into it too much now, but just knowing those three categories of, of cervicogenic and vestibular ocular and physiologic post-concussion, um, you know, ev even though you don't want to look at the individual cylinders and you always have to be aware that there's overlap, at least starting there um, can be really helpful in terms of teasing out what kind of deficiencies you're seeing and how you're going to approach that treatment for the athlete. Indeed. And, you know, these athletes are, you know, working at top level, right? You're working with our Olympic um, level athletes uh, for the United States. And, you know, it's amazing to see that, you know, just five years ago and definitely 10, but just five even, you know, folks were just being diagnosed with either malingering or being alluded mm -hmm. that they were faking it or, or letting them giving them anxiety medication because they were nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but but can you imagine just as folks were not looking at vestibular system, ocular motor system, they were just not doing neurological exams and orthopedic exams for the neck, no less, um, to rule out these things with concussion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it's sad. I mean, there's there's not a whole lot of wiggle room when you're dealing with this high level of an athlete. Um, you know, it, you're not just deciding like, should you go to school tomorrow or should you take the day off? You're deciding, can you compete in the Olympics tomorrow or can you compete in X games? And so to just kind of brush someone off as, you know, I, I you know, I think you're just anxious or, uh, you, you know, just kind of malingering or maybe being a little bit dramatic is, is awful. Uh, and fortunately, we now know from the literature that there are so many different facets that we can examine and then make a great uh, clinical plan of care for that athlete and, and make a good decision based on that. 
Yeah, and and not just as a you know a physio, but you know d- just excited from all aspects of healthcare. We're calling concussion a rehabilitative injury for the first time in 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just it's so exciting. Do, do most folks in your arena are they aware uh, that this is a rehabilitative injury? How, what's that going on in your world? Uh, I'd say my colleagues are absolutely on board with that. Uh, the difficulty I have is, is sometimes with the athletes and the parents as well, uh, because there's still so much information out there that's um, not up to date anymore. There's a lot of misconceptions out there. So that's one of the bigger fights I have to fight. Um, but we're, we're definitely making strides in the right direction. And I, I'm excited that it's it's finally being recognized as a rehabilitative injury because there's a lot we can do as healthcare providers. Indeed. Are you doing any outreach or anything like that to any of the emergency providers in Park City or uh, primary care pediatricians? Are you seeing any of that um, folks looking out for for resource assistance from you? Oh, yeah, I I do education all the time. I work with some of the local ski clubs and educate the coaches and parents. I've met with some of the pediatricians in town um, and just give it, you know, it's it's seems like basic advice, but it's still out there. I still have clinicians giving me advice to go home and sleep for a week and come back and see how you feel. And I don't know about you, but if I go see a movie midday and I walk outside after being in a dark room for two hours uh, and it's bright sunshine, I feel awful. So imagine doing that to someone who might have a concussion for a week. Um, So again, simple strategies that can make a really big difference in the quality of care and the quality of life of these athletes and patients. Indeed. And, and that's where I really encourage a skilled provider that really has, has been exposed and trained in concussion. Um, and I know that's hard to find out there. But once you find that one provider, I mean, just stick with them for, for your neurological brain health for life, essentially, um, because that's so important that our body really wants to just kind of get into homeostasis. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm in, I'm in New York. I know you're in Park City. It's a little bit more uh, peaceful out there. But, <laughs> you know, when I went to college, I actually had a really tough time <laughs> in, you know, back in the day when I was in upstate New York and Ithaca and it was quiet at night. I, mm-hmm. I never realized that I have a humming bus outside of my apartment building, basically 24 um, seven on that bus route, you know, and I never, I took for granted that I actually just acclimated to that sound in the background. Um, no different to the, to the um, grandfather clock that I inherited from my grandmother, <laughs> you, you know, every 15 minutes that, that thing's going off. But I, again, that's my, that's my homeostasis. Right, right, exactly. So again, if someone took those little things away from you, even without a concussion, you'd have a hard time sleeping and you might feel pretty crappy after. Um, so as a clinician, you have to do your due diligence. You have to be comprehensive and you, you can't just be doling out the same advice uh, for each individual in front of you. And, and certainly, uh, you know, resting for a week is not the answer. And we know that now. Indeed. And, you know, just for our listeners, we know from the work from uh, Silverberg and, and Iverson out of MGH and Harvard, well, you know, systematically reviewed uh, with BJM this last year, we're basically mm-hmm. looking at mm-hmm. 24 to 72 hours max of what we're calling rest. And that's not, you know, cocooning either. That is, you know, uh, pace graded exposure. You know, if you get symptomatic, back off of the activity, um, but you're not completely cocooning yourself. And, you know, a, a, a darker room or, or, or things like that, totally fine for the first few days. Um, mm-hmm. But we want to make sure we're not doing that for months and weeks and years, um, which we've seen, you know, consistently out there in this uh, with this injury. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Letty came out with a great article in the Clinical Journal of Sports Med in 2010 showing that progressive exercise training programs are safe and effective in treating post-concussed patients. So, again, you don't want to be locking them in a room for seven days. Indeed, yeah. And just from the psychological sequelae that can go da- like that downstream pathway, you know, it's it's just folks have FOMO. It's 2018. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we're supposed to be social animals. We want to communicate with others, you know. Um, isolation has never been a good thing uh, historically in medicine. Yeah, and that's a great point, Jess, because I have people ask me all the time, what about screen time? What do you tell your athletes of screen time? And if if I'm suspecting a concussion, you know, I, I've been trained with Dr. Kutcher to kind of look at a concussion as a, as a probability. So we look at possible concussion, probable concussion, or yes, they're concussed. Um, and when we're in that realm, I'm not going to tell them that they can't be on their phone, they can't be on their computer. I mean, you're dealing with, or I'm working with uh, 17 to 28 year olds. And, you know, if someone took my phone away or someone took my computer away, of course I would be anxious. Um, And to put an injury on top of that sounds like a terrible combination to me. So what I recommend is doing it in, in small spurts 
So, you know, take 10 minutes, go on your phone, check Instagram, respond to your text messages, read your emails, do whatever you need to do, and then put it away. And that also helps me as a clinician diagnostically, because then I can follow up with them and say, so how'd those 10 minutes go? And, and you know, sometimes they'll tell me, what do you mean? It was, it was fine. Can I use my phone more? Um, and sometimes they'll come back to me and they'll say, I could only last eight minutes. And then I had this pounding headache and I felt sick and I had to sleep for two hours. And that kind of clues me into like, okay, maybe there's something uh, ocular motor going on that I need to delve into a little bit more. Indeed. And, you know, we have to remind our listeners, especially as healthcare providers, you know, we take an oath to do no harm. And we have to remember that, you know, these patients suffer, whether it's the acute um, aspect of the injury or if it goes more chronic and it becomes like a post-concussive syndrome or a persistent symptom patient. And, you know, concussion is an injury of loss. So we have to remember that, yes, as healthcare providers, we're potentially taking things away from the, um, from the patient that we're quote unquote, telling them to do, but also that the injury also takes things away from them that we may, we may not have screened for or be aware of. Um, so really important to give them something tangible to keep them, um, you know, as normal as possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially in dealing with an athletic population, you take them out of your sport and you're almost taking away their identity. So you got to give them every bit of leeway you can on the, on the road to recovery. Yeah, you know, and concussion, you know, I say unlike a musculoskeletal injury, you know, concussion really takes away your I am. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so it from your social aspect, professional, familial, um, even, you know, personality wise can, you know, can get shifted. Uh, if you're a funny person, humor is actually a very um, high processing uh, metabolic uh component of the brain. Um, so we have to remember you're essentially, it's a neurometabolic cascade. So we're essentially, you know, short circuiting the brain for a certain amount of time. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. And, and it, which is why I love physical therapists to be working with these patient, this patient population, because we're giving them tangible, short-term attainable goals, um, that, you know, flexes with their, you know, take two steps forward and, and three steps back and, and vice versa. So it's a wonderful, mm-hmm. uh, patient rapport, patient provider rapport building um, that we have once we understand the injury. Absolutely. A little can go a long way. Indeed. Indeed. Well, now I know you're, you're so proud of the neurological participation exam um, that you guys put together in summer of 2017. I was wondering if you can kind of key the listener into to what that is and, and what that looks like. Yeah, of course. So U.S. Ski and Snowboard was, was doing uh, baseline testing for all athletes going into each season. But when I joined on, I kind of found that they were lacking a more comprehensive neurological approach, especially with uh, concussions in mind. And so I reached out to Jeff Kutcher about this, and together we put together a U.S. Ski and Snowboard-specific pre-participation exam. And there's kind of two parts to this. The first part is just a a general subjective history taking. Um, I sit down with the athlete and we go through um, kind of family history, migraines, depression, anxiety. And then we look at headache behaviors. Are they someone who suffers from headaches? Um, What triggers them? Is it dehydration? Is it lack of sleep? Is it more migranous? We get after their sleep patterns. How often does it take you to fall asleep? How long do you fall asleep each, or how long do you sleep for each night on average? And then we do a symptom checklist similar to the uh, post-concussion symptom checklist. And so we're capturing what their baseline looks like. You know, are you someone who might be fatigued on a regular basis? Do you have dizziness? Do you have um, any lightheadedness from time to time? Um, do you ever feel drowsy or anxious? Um, and again, these are all questions the athlete's going to face after concussion. But what we see is that a lot of these athletes have some of these symptoms just on a, on a day-to-day basis. And you know, there's been studies looking at student athletes with no known developmental or health problems and no prior history of concussions report some of these same nonspecific concussion-like symptoms that um, are typically related to something like stress, anxiety, depression, or insufficient sleep. So we capture all of that. Um, and it also gives us an opportunity to start to build rapport with some new athletes. Um, it, it, was, it was really fun and really rewarding. You know, these people would start to open up about headaches and, and their sleep problems. And they're like, wow, you know, no one's ever asked me this before. But yeah, I have, I have headaches probably 10 days a month and, and I have difficulty sleeping probably 20 days a month. And it's like, well, there are things we can do for you, you know, like looking at the well-being of the whole patient, not just from a concussion perspective. So that was really powerful. 
Um, and then the second half of the pre-participation exam was the neurological portion of it, um, where we were looking at just kind of screening for red flags and cranial nerves, um, doing some balance work, and then getting into the nitty gritty of the ocular motor system. So getting uh, an idea of their baseline smooth pursuits, their saccades, convergence, uh, their VOR, and their visual motion sensitivity. You would be amazed. The things that we see at baseline and um, recently, convergence and sufficiency has been shown to be a prognostic indicator for prolonged recovery after a head injury, um, which is great and um, something we're really excited about because it's a pretty simple test to do sideline. Mm -hmm. um, and up to 50% of concussed athletes present with uh, convergence and sufficiency. But again, um, up to eight or nine percent of the general population of young adults have convergence insufficiency at baseline without right. a hand injury. So if you're not capturing this at baseline and then you evaluate an athlete in front of you who just hit their head and they're saying they're fatigued, they're anxious, uh, a little dizzy and their convergence and they have convergence insufficiency, you have I mean you almost have to say like, yeah, we can't let you ski. We got to we got to monitor you for a little bit. But if you know their baseline, if you know that's normal for them, you might have a little bit more flexibility to make that call on the go no go. Mhm. Mm Indeed. And, you know, it just brings me such joy that you just rattled all that off in a few minutes and it was just it just felt so easy to just listen to you. Um, so it's it's wonderful to see how you've grown uh, throughout the years. And, and we're really lucky to have you serving our, our athletes. Oh, thanks, Jess. Um, you know, are you what are you seeing on the athlete side of things? You know, do they say, oh, well, what's this for? Are they curious? You know why you're asking them all these questions? You know, what are you seeing? I am so glad you brought that up because this is a point that I bring up to every athlete when they sit down with me to go through this. One of the first things I tell them is that there's absolutely no right or wrong answer on this pre-participation exam and nothing you put down is going to lead me to make the decision that you cannot ski tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I want to put that out there. I want to get it on the table so they feel comfortable answering these questions as honestly as possible. Um, and, and just being open with me about it so that I get a, a true picture of what this athlete looks at, at baseline. If they feel like there's any threat to them participating in their sport, I'm not going to get an honest answer. So um, just really proving from, from day one, interacting with these athletes that you're on their side and you're going to keep them doing what they love um, to your best ability, that, that really goes a long way. Indeed. Now, I know that um, the 2016-17 Berlin uh, International Consensus Guidelines stated that we do not have to be doing um, the baseline neurocognitive computerized testing uh, with mm -hmm. our athletes. Are you guys using that um, at all or just curious? Um it's, it's a complicated answer. Mm -hmm. We are such a big organization and we rely so much on uh, rotational physicians and, and physiotherapists. So we have to have a certain protocol in place. And part of that protocol uh, is computerized neurocognitive testing. Mm -hmm. With that being said, um, the people who are working with these athletes on a day-to-day -day basis have, have a little bit more flexibility to kind of stray away from that protocol, mm -hmm. um, which I think is ultimately necessary to provide the, the best care you can for that athlete in front of you. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think we're moving away from that computerized testing, especially because it's shown in the, in the first week to not make a difference in terms of um, making that go, no go call for the athlete or, or clearing them for sport. Um, we're looking at a battery of tests, their neurological examination. Um, we're throwing in the scat. We're looking at their balance. Um, we're looking at their symptoms and, and interviewing parents and coaches and getting a sense of, of what their baseline is and where they're at day to day. So to, to answer your question, long story short, <laughs> yes, we're using it, but we're kind of straying away from it. Yeah, and that seems to be um, what's going on um, in in the world internationally. Um, and again, I, we're going to have some wonderful neuropsychologists on this program, um, not to say that that is a, a bad thing at all. This is a place of building up, not tearing down. Um, but just so people understand kind of what's going on out there in this world, I know that uh, New York University, the, the university itself, does not use any neurocognitive testing as baseline um, with their concussion protocols um, for their athletes. Um, so it's just 
always interesting to see kind of what's being used out there and what's not. Um, and that's not to take away the role of the neuropsychologist. You know, if, if athletes are having, you know, symptoms two, three, four weeks out, um, and then especially at that three month mark, if they're really not, if they're struggling and really having difficulties, you know, get a neuropsychologist that is trained in concussion management. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You know, it's so very key, but um, that's wonderful to hear, um, you know, what you guys are doing over there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's, of course, a role um, for neurocognitive testing, um, but it's it's just playing a lesser role than it, it initially did over at USC and Snowboard. Um, and ho hopefully we can get that out to the, the Park City population. Right now, I think a lot of the, the high school and middle schools are, are heavily relying on that to make their return to play decision making. And, and I think there's some flaws in that. Yeah, and I think a lot of it's just misinformation, right? It has mm -hmm. such a heavy marketing component, and this is not tearing down one versus the other. Um, but For a lot sure. of folks are just actually even delivering these tests incorrectly in, in mass rooms, and you know, kids are in middle school, and, they're joking, right. joking around, and things like that. And um, you know, they have to be done one on one. They have there's so many things that you know, some variables that get mixed up, and then we we kind of you know, neurocognitive test these kids, I don't want to say to death, but they're mm -hmm. they're just ready to be done with it, and they're like, oh, this right. again, so they don't really take it seriously. So. So again, it's it's great to see you know really focusing on that neurological screen, um, that pre-participation pre-participation exam, because um, really understanding the athlete's baseline, you know, blood pressure, you know, and we saw this kind of like what 15, 20 years ago, um, screening for like heart murmurs and things like that. Um, you know, with athletes, mm -hmm. I think we're kind of doing the same thing here. Um, and you guys are very ahead of the game, ahead of the curve. Um, but I think this just needs to be happening, you know, all throughout, especially, you know, if we can combine, you know, sports physios, um, athletic trainers and physicians, you know, if we can capture our athletes in this you know, regard, I think it's just a benefit for everybody. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. About, about how long does the, um, you know, everyone always asks about time, about how long does that, you know, pre-participation exam take you guys, you know, from start to finish? 15 to 20 minutes, um, one-on-one -on -one time with the athletes. I'm always sitting down with them as they go through the history taking, um, cause there's always questions and clarifications. Um, and again, it's just a really nice opportunity to start to build the rapport with that athlete. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty quick process and pretty painless for the athlete. And again, that's something I try and highlight early on. So, uh, they have an accurate idea of exactly what they're getting themselves into. Um, but yeah, it was, it's proven to be so beneficial this season and I'm really excited for it to go organization wide next season. Indeed. You know, and I think just for a key theme or a central tenant for the listener to kind of, you know, pay attention to is, you know, Kara did start this process on her own. She went through, she, you know, she, and this is no different than anyone coming through the EIM program or really a lot of folks out there that reach out to me, you know, you feel ill-equipped as a clinician, a clinician, um, ill-equipped, I should say, as a clinician, and you kind of know what you don't know. And that does take time and exposure when folks are coming to you, like uh, Dr. Baxter had, two to four times a week as new patients. Um, you know, she definitely took her education, you know, in her own hands, kind of went through our EIM program. And at the same time, she created, you know, this whole process with Dr. Kutcher um, and, you know, is, is making positive, you know, outcomes for her, for her athletes. So I really do encourage that if you really feel frustrated out there, I know this is an international audience that's listening um, and there's different laws and, and um, bureaucracy and all these things out there, but really you can create something your own. If you get linked up with the right folks, I guarantee you, most of us really will just want to help um, and, you know, benevolently give of our time and our resources as best we can. You know, sometimes we have to say no, um, just based off of not wanting to, but just based off of time restraint. Um, but really, you know, timing is everything. So really proud of you for doing that. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it's completely doable. Um, and the really cool thing about the, the world of concussion is there's a lot of passionate clinicians out there who are really in it for the right reason. So if you find the right people to partner up with, you can really make some meaningful change in your community. Indeed, indeed. So, you know, as we kind of wrap up shop, I, I try to keep things to 30 minutes um, mm -hmm. here. You know, any any clinical pearls or, or you know, uh, just advice that you'd want to give out there to our listeners to share that you've kind of learned along the way? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing for me is that 
you can get so overwhelmed when you're seeing someone, you know, two weeks out from, from a head injury and they've been diagnosed with a concussion and you're trying to figure out exactly what you're going to tackle first. Just again, looking at it from, from those three areas, the cervicogenic, the vestibular ocular and the physiologic, um, and then kind of tackling it from there, knowing in the back of your head that of course there's going to be overlap. But, um, you know, I, I found myself early on just getting so overwhelmed and being like, Oh my gosh, I don't even, I don't even know where to start. Um, you know, but you, you get after, um, the most symptomatic piece first and, the, then kind of tease out their deficiencies from there. Um, and again, just thinking of it in those three categories is really helpful for me. Indeed. And you know what I'll do is I'll make sure to, to link out those two articles. Mm-hmm. The one that you're speaking of, I forget the author on that, unless you remember, um, but we'll get the link out to our listeners. And then also to the Matuzak and Letty article on the mm-hmm. concussion toolbox mm-hmm. on you know what an exam looks like as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's a really good place to start. And I believe, I know the Matuzak article is free open access, um, encouraging that FOMED free open access medical education community um, that's active on Twitter. Um, and I have to check the other one, but I'll, I'll get the PubMed links out to everybody. Sure. And one other article I suggest, Jess, would be one by Reynolds et al. in Neurosurgery 2014. It just highlights the importance of a, a good subjective history. If you're working with athletes or patients who might be having a hard time finding the right words and they're experiencing these very vague symptoms. Um, so just walking up to someone and say, you know, how's your mood been? They might not know how to answer that. So digging a little bit deeper, have your parents noticed anything? Have your friends noticed anything? Are you feeling more irritable uh, or a little bit more anxious? Um, you know, I've, I've had people, yeah, I remember you described that one story of the person with a fishbowl on their head when they were, um, in the grocery store. I've had people tell me that when they turn their head, they feel like it's a, a lava lamp inside. <laughs> so, you know, they're just letting the, the patient or athlete in front of you know that there's no right or wrong way to, de- to describe their symptoms and, and giving them some, some words that might be helpful, but also just asking the right questions to get the right information for you as a clinician. Indeed, and, and I kind of I'm I'm already feeling the grin that's going to come through our uh, headsets right now because you're in Park City and I'm in New York. Um, but I, you know, that's something that I said for my own injury, and it's so important is that our our brain injury and concussion patients do not have the subjective language to express the what and how they're feeling. So if you're a clinician and you're asking your patient how do you feel every four and a half minutes, they're going to get agitated with you um, mm-hmm. because they actually don't know how to express what they're feeling. Um, right. So, so yeah, so I'm glad that you're, you're living, you're living that quote there. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, before I delved into this and was working with concussion patients, I was that person. How are you feeling? And I had, I remember this one patient, he looked at me and he was like, what do you mean? How am I feeling? I don't know how I'm feeling. And, and that's kind of when it clicked and I was like, all right, I need a different approach to this. Cause this obviously isn't working. <laughs> I, I hear you. And, and again, we, we, think that we're doing, you know, our best for our patients, but sometimes when it's that very, you know, unskilled and unaware, um, which is why, again, this injury takes exposure and, and post-professional training and, and an unnatural love for, for the injury to just kind of get f- fully into. So, um, so, so excited to see what you're doing, Kara. Oh, thanks, Jess. All right. So as we wrap up, what's the best way to reach out to you? Um, I know that you're on Twitter. Um, so if you want to share your Twitter handle and if you're comfortable with anything else, you know, we'd love to let our listeners get, get a hold of you. Yeah, sure. I kind of go in and out of love with Twitter, Mm -hmm. um, but I'm always keeping an eye on it. It's C-A-R-A two underscores Baxter, B-A-X-T-E-R. Um, email works great. C Baxter at U-S-S-A dot O-R-G. Um, those are probably the two easiest. Awesome. And I think you're the only person I know with a double underscore. So, Ah! uh, (laughs) So, so yeah. kudos to you. I thought it was a typo. I was like, oh. No, no. It used to be uh, my middle initial, which is J. And then all of my friends started calling me Courage. So I got rid of that one pretty quickly. <laughs> all right. Well, that may be my own personal joke with you now, unfortunately for you. So. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay. And, and you're welcome. <laughs> all right. So, well, you know, thanks so much for coming on. I know our listeners are so lucky to have you. And I'm, you know, I think this is going to be perfect timing with the Olympics uh, coming up the, next week. And and um, again, I wish you guys luck and, and say hi to Jeff for me and, and uh, really, you know, keep safe with for yourself and your athletes, but enjoy, enjoy your travel. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Jess. And uh, be, sure to, be sure to cheer on Team USA over the next couple of weeks. It'll be an exciting time.
Oh yeah, I've got my mittens and my my hoodie ready to, ready to ready to roll. So I, I they were they were sold out in Sochi, and I had such FOMO, and I was like, oh my gosh. You got your little so, like go team mittens. <laughs> I I do, and I purchased them in July. So you're very awesome. Welcome. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right, so I will talk to you soon, and and have a safe travel. Okay, thanks so much, Jess. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Concussion Corner, hosted by Dr. Jessica Schwartz. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and not to be used as personal medical advice. Don't forget to follow us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Concussion Corner.